Mr. Sia Kemping, if six minutes. Mr. Chairman, today I would like to make a specific point. What are government's plans to support Singaporeans from the low income groups, particularly those with little or no family support? One of our key pillars for Singapore's welfare model is family as the first line of support. But for one reason or another, family members may not be able to care for each other. If we do a rough typology of family and care, we have two lines, able and willing, and we see that they fall into four categories. Able and willing, no problem and no business of the government. Another group, unable and unwilling, I think this is also beyond policy considerations. A third group, able but unwilling, has traditionally been the concern for social policy making. This group has been subjected to a wide range of interventions, including counselling, means testing for public service, and at the very last resort, legis legislation against neglect such as the Maintenance of Parents Act. We have seen over the years how even when they are able some children do not care for their parents. Today, I would like to consider the fourth group, willing but unable. How can we better support this group who want to do more but have little? This House recently debated over the motion of Care Shield Life. As we do so, I am reminded of the case of one of my residents, a man I would call S, and his younger brother. As their parents have passed away, S is left to care for his brother who suffers from cerebral palsy and is also wheelchair bound. The expenses for the two of them is about $2,000 a month. Family is receiving help from SSO and also from our other help schemes each month. But there is still a deficit of about $800 a month. So Mr S has problems looking for a full time job as he also has to look after his brother. The domestic helper that he manages to employ tend to live after a couple of months. Caregiving challenges coupled with financial challenges is such that the case management for Mr S and his brother requires a customised, a personalised case management, which current policy does not appear to address adequately. So much of caregiving currently also rests on domestic helpers. We talk about respite for caregivers, but they are mainly for family members and relatives. Yet much of the heavy lifting, quite literally in the case of Mr. S, because they would have to carry and bathe these elderly or immobile patients, and this is borne by domestic helpers. And it is especially true in the light of our aging population. Within the span of 17 years, the proportion of individuals aged above 65 years old grew from 7% to 13% in 2017. And by 2030, we all know that one in four Singaporeans will be aged 65 and above. As is, as of 2004, there were already more than 210,000 <coughs> caregivers in Singapore, tending to the disabled, elderly, physically and mentally ill. Currently within Singapore, there are support groups, community programs and services within the social service sector that is providing help and assistance to caregivers intending for their beloved ones. Given, given the rising need for caregiving in Singapore, the government has in recent years mobilised action to provide greater infrastructure and services support to caregivers. The government has planned for increase in daycare and home care space from 5,000 and 8,000 to 6,200 6, and 10,000 respectively in 2020. However, we have a dilemma of long-term care in Singapore. For instance, while there is demand for institutions and services to support long-term care, money and space for such institutions are both limited. We need, therefore, to provide greater support for this willing but unable group to allow as many Singaporeans as possible to be cared for and housed by their own families. And this includes domestic helpers who live in the same house. What can be done to ensure the same respite and welfare for these helpers? For example, when we go to the homes to visit some of these patients, we should also find time to speak with and interview the domestic help. Another way is to touch base with them during their medical checkups. We now have a compulsory medical examination for helpers. Can we also include a psychological examination for those who are caring for the elderly or the physically challenged? 
Many helpers may not be given their days off with families citing that they pay them in lieu. But money does not compensate for a day off from the day grind. Another group of Singaporeans facing challenges are those who stay in rental flats. M Ministry MSF had earlier announced the plan to set up social service hubs in and around rental precincts. How will this initiative better support families living in rental flats and how can the community play a part? Finally, PM at his post-NDR dialogue said that Singapore must not allow social stratification to harm. To do so will of course require us to start at MOE. But we also need to also remember that MSF has a large part to play to ensure that Singaporeans who are less fortunate, people like my resident Mr S and his brother are not left behind. Of this latter group, I urge the Ministry to give greater attention to the group of willing but unable. This is a special group which holds a, resources, a resource that no state intervention can substitute, the genuine love and care of a family member. Thank you.